Welcome to the Ashtakar Frontiers of Science Lectures in the Eberly College of Science. Good morning, I'm Charles Anderson, Associate Professor of Biology in the Eberly College of Science and the Chair of our College's Sustainability Council. I'll be your moderator for this year's lecture series. Before we introduce our speakers, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping notes. We will be recording today's lecture, which will be posted to the lecture series website as soon as it is ready. At the end of the lecture, there will be a question and answer session. You can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to enter your questions, which I will share with our speakers. The lecture series was founded by Abai Ashtakar, founding director of the Institute for Gravitation and the Cosmos and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. It owes its success to Barbara Kennedy, who presided over the series during its first 25 years, making it one of the most successful science outreach events in Pennsylvania. This year, the Ashtakar Frontiers of Science lectures are entitled Sustainability, How Science Can Help Achieve the UN's 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. The series will focus on the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, which are a call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. Today's speakers are Dr. Peter Buck, Nebraska Hernandez, and Nyla Holland, who comprise the Penn State Sustainability Institute's Environmental Justice Project team. Dr. Buck serves as the Academic Programs Manager at the Sustainability Institute and as an affiliate faculty member in Educational Theory and Policy. His work resides at the nexus of education, democracy, risk, ethics, and sustainability, and has appeared most recently in the Journal of Environmental Studies and Sciences and the International Journal of Ethics Education. Mr. Hernandez is a senior majoring in geography and an officer in the Minorities in Earth and Mineral Sciences student organization. He also serves on the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection's Environmental Justice Advisory Board. Ms. Holland is a senior majoring in political science and African-American studies and is also a first year graduate student in public policy. She is also the 2020-21 president of Penn State's Black Caucus. Today, Dr. Buck, Mr. Hernandez, and Ms. Holland will deliver a presentation entitled Mapping a Just and Sustainable Future for Pennsylvania. Peter, Nebraska, and Nyla, thank you so much for being here today. We look forward to learning more about this very interesting and relevant topic. Well, thank you so much for having us here today. Uh, I'm Peter Buck, and with me, as uh, Charles said, are Nebraska Hernandez, and Nyla Holland. We are thrilled to be with here to share, thrilled to be with you here today to share a project that is really, really important to us. So I will just go ahead and get into it. So what we'll do today is we'll ground everything in a discussion of rights. We'll go into the sustainable development goals and talk about environmental justice. From there, Nebraska and Nyla will walk you through how we're um, doing environmental justice programming at Penn State and dive pretty deep into a mapping project that shows cumulative health impacts on populations in Pennsylvania. We'll talk about our next steps, how you can get more involved, and then we'll take questions. So we do work at Penn State's Sustainability Institute, and the Institute is tasked with integrating sustainability and institutionalizing sustainability into all of the operations of the university. That includes everything from the curriculum and our teaching, which I work on, research, our operations, whether that's energy management or food purchasing, student life, and outreach, um, so including work with, say, WPSU. It is exciting work because we get to touch most of the parts of the university on a daily basis um, in order to make a better world. So in Pennsylvania, we have a, a right through our Constitution, Article 1, Section 27, 
It says that the people have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. Pennsylvania's public natural resources are the common property of all the people, including generations yet to come. As trustee of these resources, the Commonwealth shall conserve and maintain them for the benefit of all people. And I stress there, all people, and it says that the people have a right. This is not an entitlement. It is something that, uh, <clears throat> that the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in the 1970s agreed to. And yet, according to our Department of Environmental Protection, one third of Pennsylvanians live in a quote unquote environmental justice zone. That, those would be areas that have been highlighted because of the possibility of environmental health risk to the populations that live there, likely because of poverty or because of their racial or ethnic status. They are a minority. We understand that they are likely to be uh, uh, at more risk for environmental health hazards. So this has been some of the basis for what it is that we're doing. Now, if we zoom out to the sustainable development goals that Ms. Uh, Dr. Anderson addressed at the beginning, there are 17 of them. And they do range from ending poverty to creating partnerships for the goals, but they have sort of five areas of focus. So at the top there on the left and goal number 17, you can see partnership, which can enable us to do more things. But then there's also the economy, society, and the biosphere and the natural systems in which we work and running through those is an ethic of peace so we can talk about people prosperity planet peace and partnership and those range at, uh, across all 17 of the goals and suffused in a notion of peace is certainly an ethic of justice nyla Sure, and I want to echo Peter and say um, thank you to you all for joining in, um, also for having us. So um, what is environmental justice? So um, it is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of background, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Um, and I think the next slide goes into what exactly we mean by fair treatment and meaningful involvement. So fair treatment means that no group of people will have um, a disproportionate burden of negative environmental consequences resulting from um, laws or policies, um, well, uh, industrial, governmental, or commercial um, laws or policies or operations. Um, meaningful involvement means that people will have the opportunity to participate in decisions about um, activities that affect them and their environment and their health um, and having equal opportunity there. And these two graphics that we have seen, oh, sorry, on the, on the sides of their link, these sustainable development goals to certain environmental justice um, principles. So these two um, concepts are very um, interconnected and apply directly to one another. Um, so the history of environmental justice. So um, thinking back um, in American history, a lot of movements, um, mainstream movements have uh, systemically and socially um, excluded people of color and also low income people, um, well, people of low income. And uh, we've seen that with the feminist movement as well as the environmental movement. Um, it did not recognize the plights of people of color, um, especially in urban areas. Um, this movement kind of looked uh, to 
towards more of wildlife preservation and issues that weren't affecting um, those most marginalized at the time. And grassroots activists noted the elitism of this movement and decided to organize amongst themselves. Um, so as they started to organize for um, a number of years, on the side, you can see this book called Dumping and Dixie, which was published in 1990 by the father of environmental justice, um, Robert Bullard. And it chronicles um, the grassroots um, efforts of five different um, African-American communities impacted by environmental issues. Um, and this uh, predates this um, first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit held in 1991. And there were a very um, large, diverse group of delegates from 50 states, different territories, um, indigenous folks, black folks, um, other people of color, and they created these 17 principles of environmental justice. So these principles span a whole lot of areas, just as the sustainable development goals do as well. So these range from affirming the sacredness of Mother Earth, um, connections to, I guess, um, your surroundings, um, calls for universal protections from toxic waste and pollution, demanding equal participation um, in your, um, speaking to the meaningful involvement we spoke of earlier. Um, it advocates for quality health care, um, the enforcement of informed consent. It affirms the sovereignty and self-determination of Native peoples, calls for social justice, education, and looking at um, consumers and their roles um, in making um, and eliminating environmental injustices. So there are 17 different principles, and I encourage you to look into them and see how broadly they span um, as well. So <clears throat> what, what Nyla just showed us is some of the connections that are nascent there between the principles of environmental justice and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And meaningful involvement and fair treatment are really shared there between them. So I'll just share with you a little bit of where those connections touch very closely so that if we want to use science in the service of sustainable devel development and environmental justice, where might we be looking? So peace, justice, and strong institutions has targets. Every single one of the sustainable development goals has targets and then empirical indicators to let us know whether or not we would be meeting the targets and therefore the goals. Uh, you can look into all 169 of them if you wish. I'll share a few of them with you here because they're measurable and that's what we need in order to do science. So we want to ensure equal access and justice for all effective, accountable and transparent institutions, responsive, inclusive, participatory and representative decision-making access to information and protect fundamental freedoms, promote and enforce non-discriminatory laws and policies. So notions of informed consent, meaningful participation and fair treatment are very much built into this. Going back to goal three, good health and well-being, reduce the number of deaths and illnesses from hazardous chemicals and air, water and soil pollution and contamination. And so Nebraska, will be showing you where and how this matters in places in Pennsylvania and connecting those two policy decisions. Risk uh, reduction and management of national and global health risks. Obviously right now during a pandemic, this is very much top of mind, but we can think about other really large impacts from chemical production. Uh, the, the burning of fossil fuels, the use of agricultural chemicals, et cetera, et cetera, as introducing high le higher levels of risk into our uh, populations vis-a-vis -vis the environment. We talk about reducing inequalities 
between and among people. So empowering and promoting the social, economic, and political inclusion of all. So this aligns very much with goal 16 and ensuring equal opportunity and reduce inequalities of outcome. Um, and this has to do both with legal status and with economic opportunity, which impacts on your health play a role in that. So as an individual or a community or a whole population put more at risk at something, it can hinder your economic opportunity because of health impacts. And finally, we all live in places and who gets to decide where and how our places are built and how we move around within them and who controls those decisions. So talking about access for all to adequate, safe and affordable housing and public services. And it says they're upgrade slums. And in the United States, we tend not to think that we have slums, but we certainly have, uh, well, in, in parts of the country, we do have slums and in uh, neglected and uh, deliberately designed parts of especially minority urban areas, we have places of structured, created poverty that create negative health outcomes. Um, and where we've had under target 11.3, uh, less sustainable urbanization and capacity for participatory planning and management. Uh, we haven't done such a great job of reducing the adverse per capita environmental impact of cities et cetera, et cetera. So by looking at these four goals and their targets in tandem, we can begin to envision or infuse environmental justice into it. And we know very well that the history of the United States is rife with structural legal I'm going to say that again, structural and legal racist po uh, policy. I would encourage everyone to read this book, The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. It is a legal history, does not have a lot of science in it, but it talks about planning and who got to um, build and design the communities in the United States. Much of this follows the Second World War, but not entirely, and how federal policies um, limited and directed investments into and away from certain areas through a process that we now think of as redlining, or we call redlining, was called redlining, where these red lines, and they're right there in front of you, were put around high hazard or hazardous investment areas. Those were black communities, either already black or designed to become black communities. And we know that those have been zoned in, uh, um, at um, high, much higher rates for industrial and waste facilities and things of that nature, which by their very nature put those populations at much higher risk, such that Dr. Bullard found in Dumping in Dixie, the book that Nyla brought up in Nebraska and Nyla will show you in more detail later, put black um, and minor other minority populations at higher risk um, for health impacts than their poor white counterparts. So we can't, um, you can't take race out of this. So I'm going to turn this over uh, to Nyla again, and she's going to talk with you about how um, we're designing programming here at Penn State. Nyla? Yeah, thank you. So um, a couple of years ago, the Sustainability um, Institute um, received an um, I guess, met the call to explore environmental justice. Um, so 
they were pressured by students who, um, well, I guess the university um, received this call from students to um, focus on environmental justice. Penn State needs to pay more attention to this and then also act upon um, this issue. So um, recognizing a need to go beyond climate action and sustainability um, in the kind of minute sense of recycling and uh, personal um, consumption um, to address the inequities that environmentalism in this um, day brings up. So the Sustainability Institute has recently received funds to um, award a curricular development grant to, fa to faculty members who teach courses on um, social and environmental justice. And um, following in, I guess, the footsteps of a very instrumental um, intern, Janelle, um, who worked with Peter and was um, very um, integral to environmental justice becoming um, front of mind here at the SI, um, both Nebraska and I were hired in fall 2019 as environmental justice interns at the Sustainability Institute. So um, what do we do? Um, one, we work to identify folks across um, the university who are doing environmental justice work. As we're talking about the um, sustainable development goals and the principles, we can see that a lot of different areas are touched by environmental justice, meaning this is an interdis interdisciplinary um, field where we can look at people in the College of Education, to folks in earth and mineral sciences, to the Everly College of Sciences, different folks around the university who are doing work related to environmental justice. Um, we work to engage them in relevant student organizations from your eco action to student government to the multicultural caucuses or manners, which are minorities um, in agriculture or minorities in earth and mineral sciences. Um, we work to empower them to put on their own environmental justice programming, um, learning, and engaging in informative and interactive programming. Um, we are working to um, bring Dr. Robert Bullard, father of environmental justice, um, to um, the Penn State's uh, colloquium on the environment this, um, this spring. Um, and I think we'll talk about that a little later. Um, we work to build connections with our stakeholders um, to promote awareness and spur change. So folks in the Department um, of Health or EPA, folks across the university and administration, community members. So meeting with them, talking to them about this project um, and seeing what role they can play um, in these goals that we have. And lastly, to create an environmental justice map of Pennsylvania. And on the side, you can um, see um, a, a screenshot of our web page um, where we have a list of programming um, and interactive activities that folks can engage in on this front. Um, um, and I will turn it over to Nebraska to talk about the specifics of this mapping project. Uh, thank you, Nyla, and I also wanted to briefly um, thank the College of Everly Science for asking us to speak today. Um, so kind of to just jump right in, um, as Nyla had mentioned, our environmental justice mapping project has been almost two years in the making. I believe it started in November of 2019, um, so it really just goes to show how time flies. Um, but within that process of several months of figuring out a methodology, we had several meetings with um, stakeholder groups, including uh, the Department of Environmental Protection of Pennsylvania, members of the larger EPA um, based in DC, um, community groups across Pennsylvania, um, and then also the University of Washington, which created their own version of an environmental health disparity maps. Um, that we closely followed and were in collaboration with. So essentially this mapping project divides um, 9,740 census block groups of Pennsylvania into groups of 974 to explore various environmental exposures, environmental effects, and socio-demographic information across the state. And so you can think of, and 
we'll go into more detail about what a census block group is, but you can essentially think of it as a neighborhood if you're not familiar with the term. Um, so using EJ screen data, which is data from the federal government run by the EPA and modified methodologies from previous environmental justice mapping projects, as I mentioned, the University of Washington, but also um, the California Enviro screen, which is based in California, um, to create a comprehensive environmental justice map of Pennsylvania. And so, as I just mentioned, uh, there are mapping project precedents. So on the left, you're going to see California Enviro screen, um, which uses essentially the same methodology as us, um, environmental exposures, environmental effects, sociodemographic information. Um, in the middle, you will see the um, Environmental Protection Agency's EJ screen, which collects a whole host of indicators and variables um, and comprehensive literature reviews and studies to um, map different indicators. Um, it's not the best, and that's why we are mapping our own mapping project. Um, and on the far right, you'll see the University of Washington's environmental health disparity maps, um, which we closely followed. And you'll also see the same methodology, environmental exposures, environmental effects, socioeconomic factors, as well as sensitive populations. And so through the process of creating our maps and discussing with stakeholders, as Nyla briefly mentioned early, earlier, the meaningful involvement of different, different people um, with different perspectives and different backgrounds to identify which indicators are relevant to Pennsylvania. And so for under environmental exposures, we have diesel emissions, ozone concentration, particulate matter, and traffic density. Under environmental effects, we have lead risk and exposure, proximity to treatment storage and disposal facilities, proximity to risk management plan sites, and proximity to Superfund sites. And under sociodemographic factors, we have race and ethnicity, income as a percent of poverty, poor educational attainment, population over 64, and population under five. And briefly, um, the difference between environmental exposures and environmental effects is environmental exposures focus, uh, focuses on the measured quantitative um, concentrations of these indicators within census block groups, while environmental effects uses quantitative data to predict or project the um, proximity to harm due to the adjacency of communities to these sites. Um, and sociodemographic factors are essentially self-explanatory where they follow sociodemographic and economic um, indicators. And so our final goal of this mapping project is to have a usable map that would be hosted on an online platform. Um, but until then, um, we can discuss more static mapping that we created. Um, so, for example, on the top right, you will see traffic density in Pennsylvania, and traffic density is measured um, as the numbers of vehicles that travel through the census plot group per day. And with our um, mapping tool, it is based off of deciles, as I said, and so you can read the map as the lightest shade, which would be uh, white on this, would be decile one, which would have the least number of cars traveling through the census block group per day, to the highest, which would be decile 10, which would be the dark blue. And so the number, you, you can read it as essentially a sequential color scheme that shows an increasing number of uh, the indicator, but in this case, traffic density, as you increase in the the saturation of the color blue. Um, and so you can see certain patterns on the map. You can see that there are higher levels of traffic density in metropolitan areas, as you would figure. So Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Harrisburg, Lancaster, and Erie kind of jump forward on the map um, with its traffic density. But you can also somewhat make out interstates, like Interstate um, 81, which would go kind of north eastward from Chambersburg through Harrisburg, and also the interstates around Philadelphia. Um, and then for another example on the left, um, you'll see racial and ethnic minority distribution in Pennsylvania. And as I said briefly, um, 
you can read it as an increasing percentage of the population is a part or member of a racial and ethnic minority group as you increase on the color scale and increase on the decile scale. So decile 10 would be the highest and decile one would be the lowest. And so um, as you would expect, there are higher concentrations of racial and ethnic minorities in Philadelphia, in Pittsburgh, in Reading, in Lancaster, in Harrisburg, and essentially cities um, across the Commonwealth. And so just to more deep dive into specific um, indicators um, like environmental exposures, um, traffic density in Philadelphia, now that we're at a city scale, um, you can make out more specific patterns. And that's a part of our static mapping for this mapping project is to look at larger scale um, city data or city scale, excuse me, um, to look at how patterns are different at different scales. Um, so in Philadelphia, you can make out different streets. You can make out Broad Street, which runs from north to south through the center of the city in the dark blue. You can also make out I-95, which goes along the outer portion of the city along the Delaware River. Um, and as I said, you can, you can interpret this map as decile 10 having the highest traffic density, which would be the darkest blue, and the lightest color white, which would have um, the least traffic density. And on the left, you're going to see traffic density in Pittsburgh. And it's kind of the same, obviously, where there are interstates, um, there's a higher traffic density. And so you can see in Pittsburgh, the interstates off of the base map have the highest um, levels of traffic density. And this goes into what Peter had mentioned earlier with um, The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. He mentions frequently in his book about how redlining of communities resulted in the siting of environmental hazards or even highways through predominantly Black and Latinx communities. Um, and so I'll go into a little more depth about that a little bit. Um, so environmental effects, as I said, is, a, is measured as adjacency or um, the potential risk of communities due to environmental hazards. And so lead exposure risk in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia um, is presented on this slide. And lead exposure risk is measured as the percentage of housing units in a census block group that was built before 1960 as a proxy um, due to the fact that before the 60s and 70s, um, lead was often used in pipes or in house painting, like painting on houses. Um, and so that had a disproportionate impact on children and cognitive development. Um, so on the left, you're going to see lead exposure risk in Pittsburgh. And on the right, you're going to see lead exposure risk in Philadelphia. And to kind of describe what's going on in, in oh, I guess that's for a later slide. Never mind. <laughs> Um, and then, as I said, the third um, category is sociodemographic indicators. And so this is racial and ethnic minority distribution in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. And so if you look on the right, you will see um, Philadelphia's map. And there are high concentrations of Black and Latinx communities in North and West Philly. And in the suburbs, there are predominantly white communities, which you can see on this map um, due to the large concentrations and clustering of the decile 10 in North and West Philly, and a more um, diverse, not diverse, <laughs> a more um, patch-like quality as soon as you cross into the suburbs of Philadelphia. Um, and then on the left, you'll see racial and ethnic minority distribution in Pittsburgh, and there are um, Black communities that show up as higher concentrations in decile 10, um, in neighborhoods like Oakland and Pittsburgh. And so when discussing um, environmental justice or mapping, Peter, did you wanna say something? Yeah, I was just gonna say there's a, I'm, I, I'm going to apologize very quickly. There's a missing slide here, the slide that shows the, over, the overlapping oh, okay. aspects. Um, if you I wanted would, to go back to the lead exposure risk side, I will. I could, okay. <laughs> yep. Hmm. Go ahead. If you want to, yeah, good, yeah. So um, essentially the slide that Peter was um, 
discussing about is we had a slide that showed lead exposure risk in Philadelphia, um, the percent of ethnic and racial minorities, as well as a 1937 map of redlining um, in Philadelphia. And in these three maps, you can kind of tell the stories of environmental injustice and racism through geographies of segregation, geographies of violence, um, and geographies of essentially injustice and racism. Um, where portions of North Philadelphia adjacent to Center City had been labeled as D hazardous by the um, housing, un housing grading system um, from the early 30s, 40s, and 50s um, that labeled areas that were predominantly Black or Latinx as hazardous. And to this day, you can see how these histories perpetuate into the into the present and into the future where these areas have the highest risk of lead exposure due to aging housing units built before 1960. And unless there is remediation efforts, um, these disproportionate impacts will be will be felt by Black and Latinx communities in Philadelphia. Um, and so it's important not only to see spatial relationships um, between current day trends, but also through temporal scales that might be missed um, in our mapping project that we hope to supplement with qualitative data. And so speaking on the limitations of our mapping project, um, one good example is edge effects. Um, focusing on Pennsylvania specifically it ignores concerns that may be adjacent to Pennsylvania communities along state boundaries. So for example, if there is a Superfund site um, in Youngstown, Ohio, um, the Pennsylvania map would not pick that up as it is across the state line and our map is focused in Pennsylvania. Um, or if you wanted to be in Philadelphia, um, if there was an environmental hazard that was across the Delaware River in Jersey, we might miss that on our mapping project. Another example of a geographical limitation or concern to have is scale. Um, utilizing census block group level data can hide smaller or larger scale patterns. And so, for example, if we were to map things at a county level, you might not specifically see um, differences within Allegheny County, um, which is the county that Pittsburgh is in, um, when it comes to different neighborhoods experiencing differential impacts of environmental hazards and exposures. And so it's important with all geographical um, studies or GIS tools to understand how scale might affect how data is visualized. Um, and as I briefly mentioned earlier, temporal this map focuses on current EJ concerns. It doesn't display historical processes that create these injustices. And so essentially we hope to include qualitative data and lived experiences within this mapping project because those are um, just as valid as quantitative data and, and are exceedingly important in discussing environmental racism and injustice. So I think I'm going to turn it back over to Nyla. Yes, thank you. Um, so I feel like at the beginning of this project, when Nebraska would give that spiel, I felt like he was speaking a language I didn't understand. But um, I think um, after learning more about the mapping project, I've been able to understand more. And I think one of my roles in this internship is how to supplement that work so um, those who aren't maybe as technical um technically um i guess fluent um are able to understand and engage um with the map so i think both of our pieces to this project will help bring a holistic and beneficial experience to those who are able to use this um tool so thank you again nebraska um so um, what are our goals of making this map? One, um, we see two different kind of, well, three different audiences for it. So one, we're seeing these environmental justice injustices all across Pennsylvania. What can be done about it? So can we take this tool to the legislators, to your council members, to your mayor, 
um, to the governor and um, utilize it in advocating for that, um, that clause in the Pennsylvania Constitution that um, all Pennsylvanians have a right um, to this um, healthy living environment. Um, also with our stakeholders, how can different people within their communities, activists um, work to use this tool to do those same things um, and empower their communities to, um, to address the environmental injustices in their areas. And then lastly, for regular folks to use the tool, see, I live in this zip code, what is happening around me? How can I make sense of this reality that I'm living in? Um, so people, all different people can connect with this. So to increase accessibility and engagement with this mapping tool, um, we are creating these um, supplemental materials to accompany the map, which include a report of the um, methodology that we're using in our intention. So with those indicators that Nebraska um, spoke of, it'll explain what is a Superfund site? Why do diesel emissions matter? Why is the population under five a relevant um, demographic to look at? So walking people um, through why the map is the way that it is. Um, also our uh, glossary, so you can understand the terms that are being used in the map. Also, um, a kind of report of uh, Pennsylvania environmental policy histories. So how do um, zoning and the policies that are around coincide with the history of segregation that Nebraska spoke of and discrimination within an area? How do the different laws and programs um, affect people over time and right now? So this example I've been using, for example, if there is a, a program to say plant trees that isn't accessible or has exclusionary criteria. People who can afford um, and access this program will get more trees in their area. Because a city may already be economically and racially segregated through redlining, there will be more trees in an affluent and or white area. Thus, people who don't live there are more likely to have asthma, suffer from heat stroke, stress, depression, have respiratory disease, sleep worse, a host of things. How can we communicate these things and contextualize that um, within um, Pennsylvania's history? Also, um, a social media engagement app. So uh, with the map, there aren't like pictures on it. Um, we're looking at uh, scales and colors, but how can we look at an area, say in Erie or Pittsburgh or even State College um, and see um, what people are experiencing. So encouraging people to upload pictures of environmental injustices in their areas, in their neighborhoods that are impacting them. Um, I can think of a host of places in Philadelphia I hope to take pictures of and upload to this map so people can see um, visually these EJ issues we're talking about. Also um, an activity, environmental justice simulation we're thinking about. Um, so if you are born in a certain zip code, you have a certain race, a certain income, how does that impact say your life expectancy? How does that impact your, your health um, and your life trajectory? Um, we know all these things have uh, real life consequences. So how can we maybe simulate and have people connect with um, maybe uh, life journeys that they would never um, have the opportunity to um, attempt to understand. Also a list of resources to learn about environmental justice from books to um, scholarly articles to videos or documentaries to watch so people can learn more about environmental justice on this um, webpage. And last year, Lastly, a connection of sustainability and environmental justice. So as those graphics in the first few slides showed, um, each of these environmental justice principles are connected to sustainability. So um, emphasizing that if you care about one, you should care about the other and how are these um, fundamentally um, and intricately um, connected to one another.
So um, what are our next steps um, to finish this map and all of the material to come up with an interactive um, and accessible tool for people to use, publishing it on an open site for um, people to access it. We're continuing to present to different stakeholders um, about this map and advocating um, for environmental justice. Um, we're looking to establish a permanent position at Penn State to maintain the site and the tool. Um, so it's being updated with um, fresh and accurate um, data um, and being tended to. We're continuing to work with organizations um, to create um, more environmental justice programming from movie showings to discussions or workshops or art installations, anything you can really think of. Um, to culminate um, this year with uh, Dr. Robert Bullard coming in April. So um, yeah, come to the colloquium on the environment. It is um, the beginning of April, I believe April 1st. Um, there he will be speaking. It'll be a fantastic event. We are been looking forward to this for <laughs> over a year now. Um, but he has so much wisdom and experience that I think especially our state college community um, will benefit from. It'll be Thursday, April 1st at um, 7 p.m. So if you go to our website, sustainability.psu.edu, you can register um, there. So um, I don't know, uh, Peter, if you wanna talk about this slide, sure. Yeah, sure. So thank you so much. Uh, we have a book club in cooperation with the McCourtney Institute for Democracy, where we will be reading Dr. Bullard's book, The Wrong Complexion for Protection, uh, which is a really a, um, an update of the work that he's been doing for decades and decades now, but is really, um, uh, dealing with some of the exigence that we've seen over the last few years. So if you think about the impact of Hurricane Katrina on Black populations in the United States, it was really, really significant and Latinx um, communities. If you look even more up to date and you think about what happened with Hurricane Harvey in a city like Houston, it's front and center, um, the disparities that we're talking about but it's also a way for us to think about, um, no matter who we are, no matter what our backgrounds are, about how we can think about these issues in order to make better places to live and governments that are more representative of all of us so that the risks and benefits of our society and our economy and the amenities of the natural environment are available more equitably for all of us. And so I'll be leading this discussion at 4 p.m. on March 22nd. You can get the book through Petit Library, our university libraries, for free. And you can download each chapter into a PDF. Um, I would also encourage you, if you want to buy the book, of course, to buy the book. You know, I'm sure Dr. Bullard wouldn't mind having a little bit of income. But this is this will take place about nine or 10 days before he comes to campus and we would love to see you there. Um, I could speak a little to this slide. Um, yeah, so just other ways to get involved. So again, our website specifically is sustainability.psu.edu slash EJ. There you can find all of these different opportunities that are constantly being updated um, so you can see what fits in your schedule if you'd like to learn more. You yourself, if you'd like to go to or create um, a program of your own. Um, we also encourage you to be civically engaged. So if you want to write or speak with your legislators about EJ issues and advocate um, in that way. Um, and then also, I think what gets to the heart of what environmental justice is about um, fair treatment and meaningful involvement, um, but also just understanding it in regards to equity and um, this moment, especially that we are living in, 
right now. So we encourage you to work to include the most silenced voices in the work that you do. Um, a couple environmental justice principles that speak to this. One calls for the education of present and future generations on social and environmental issues. Um, and then also principle five affirms the fundamental right to political, economic, cultural, and environmental self-determination of all peoples. And I think each of us, um, especially in the Everly College of Science at Penn State have a role in advocating for both of these things and um, doing that work especially. So we encourage you to make your classrooms, your workplaces and neighborhoods a place where everyone has decision-making power and the ability to be happy and free from harm. So talking about EJ is the first step. Checking out our mapping tool is the second step, but what are you going to do about it? Um, I believe is even more important. So we want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, I hope that you've been able to see the connections between uh, the, the program that the Eberly College of Science has put on over the last few weeks through the Ashtakar Foundation's or Frontiers of Science uh, series, and then how the, the, the targets and the purposes within the Sustainable Development Goals are connected to environmental justice and what that requires of us in our decision-making to do in order for people to be healthy and that those people who have been uh, put at the most risk or to say another way, damaged the most uh, too often on purpose by our society and our economy and our predecessors' decisions that it requires something more of us and we invite you to continue to be involved with our programming or as Nyla said, to make your own no matter what it is that you do. So if there are questions, uh, we are here to answer them. Um, and, and Charlie, should I stop sharing my slides or should I leave it up? That's completely up to you. Um, so you can choose whether you wanna keep the slide up or not. Uh, if you wanna maybe take the slides down that will allow people to see bigger pictures of everybody on the screen. Um, so first off, Peter Nebraska and Nyla, thank you so much for sharing your inspiring work with us. And I will applaud you on behalf of the audience. Thank you so much. Um, we will now open the floor for 30 minutes of questions from our audience. And we already have one question that's been entered using the Q&A button. I encourage our audience to continue to enter questions uh, using that method. And you can direct those to either one or all three of the speakers as you choose. Um, I will go ahead and share the first question. So this is a question from Barbara Kennedy, the former organizer of the seminar series. Um, in the Philadelphia exposure maps, there's a very conspicuous white square in the middle of the map that is completely surrounded by wide areas marked with very dark ink. What factors affect the drastically different exposures in these areas? Um, I can speak to this one. So the pricks of being from Philadelphia, I'm able to kind of contextualize those different things. Um, so I think I know what white square you're talking about. That is a very huge park. Um, it's called Hunting Park in North Philadelphia. There is nothing there but some tennis courts and a lot of trees and open space. So um, that's why you wouldn't see there. There's also some other spots. Uh, the, Phil the Northeast Philadelphia Airport is a big white spot as well as the Philadelphia International Airport that doesn't have a whole lot going around with the exceptions of some things maybe like diesel emissions or traffic density around the area. So um, there's there's not much going on there. And I think um, within the methodology and um, other reports that we'll put out, it'll kind of speak to some of these nuances um, within what will come out. So also, for example, Philadelphia is a very old city. So there will be more uh, lead <laughs> exposures than say other cities where we may see maps for. So um, we definitely want to name that um, so people can make sense of the map. 
and I had just uh, the slide that I said was missing. It, it was in a different somehow. I opened the the wrong version of the presentation. So that was the slide that Nebraska had talked us through, showing the redlining, et cetera, et cetera. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question from Catherine Smith, who asks. Does Penn State have a student-run think tank on public policy? And if yes, is sustainability a part of it? This mapping project would seem to be a natural fit. There are student organizations around the university that do things with policy. So like there are these students for science, for example, and they have been very involved with uh, policy and policy advocacy, often around the issue of climate change and action on climate, but other things, non-discrimination, especially where gender is concerned in fields of science. The um, school of SIA, the School of International Affairs, is a very policy-focused school, as is the School of Public Policy, of which NILA is a part. And surely there are um, uh, very uh, motivated students. I don't know that there is a student policy think tank doing, doing that work. The last thing I'll say is that through the Sustainability Institute, we have um, a cooperation with the International Club of Rome, which is a sustainability focused organization. And Madison Mitchell, Maddie Mitchell, has been the student organizer for a global youth summit focused on sustainable sustainable development as framed by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, but I can't speak to how much that has been policy oriented um, in a, I guess I'll call a hard way. And Nyla in Nebraska, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. But I agree with with the with the the question and the and the thrust of the question. I think that um, we would love to have, uh, well, more, more energy, enthusiasm, and focus for the, for the project to keep pushing it along. So thank you. Great, thanks. And one follow-up comment um, from Catherine Smith is a uh, suggestion to look at uh, the Roosevelt Institute of Student-Run Public Policy Development that's located at several universities. So thank you so much there. Um, that's great. Thank you, Catherine. I have another question uh, from Lauren McCarthy who asks, um, I'm wondering about the factors you included on the maps. Are there plans to include environmental impacts of fracking in Pennsylvania? Um, so we explored um, looking at fracking data and natural gas infrastructure um, from organizations like Frack Tracker. Um, obviously since fracking is a large environmental concern across the Commonwealth. Um, we believe that there wasn't um, data available at the scale of analysis that we were conducting at the census block group scale kind of level of analysis um, that would have been useful for our mapping tool. I think in the future iterations of this mapping project, it would be important to look at, obviously, because methane emissions Fugitive methane emissions from natural gas infrastructure is a leading contributor to um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, worldwide, but especially from Pennsylvania. And there are health concerns from methane emissions. Um, so definitely in the future, we are looking to um, include it further. And Great, something, you. And, and I think there's something to add to that too. So we had two meetings with staff from Frack Tracker to talk about um, how how if we would work together or you know how how this would happen and so Nebraska addressed the both the, the the methane emissions issue but then also some of the technical issues that that 
you know, the methodologies don't necessarily line up right now. Um, there, there could be things that we might be able to include like deep injection wells, for example, those are static. We could identify them. There may be literature that would give us a, an idea of how to, um, put them. The problem is that the way that the deciles work, it wouldn't, there are only, there are fewer than 15, I think, deep injection wells. So the decile won't necessarily tell you very much. Um, so we'll, we'll have to figure it out. There's a lot of research that could be done um, for, for um, methods uh, with this map as well to refine them. So, which Nebraska knows way more about than, than I do. Yeah, that's great. I think, um, you know, that's something where the statistics department in the College of Science might be really, some members of the of that might be really interested in working with you. Um, along similar lines, I actually have a question of my own relating to the map, uh, the environmental justice map. So um, one of my colleagues in the biology department, Dr. Nita Bharti, um, uses cell phone data along with other geographically resolved um, data to track disease, uh, you know, spreads and, and um, you know, dynamics in populations. I'm wondering whether we could uh, kind of build this into a more dynamic system by doing things like monitoring the relationship between air quality and impacts on human health. Um, so just a thought for maybe, you know, sort of moving that map into a, a sort of living system that might be um, useful on, a, on a, an immediate basis. That was more of a comment than a question, so. <laughs> Um, great. I have another question from uh, Joan Bouchard who asks, is this Penn State project unique among universities? And if so, how did it come about that we began it? And where does the funding come from, from, from private donors, the Pennsylvania State Government, general university funds? Maybe just saying something about the foundations of the project. Nebraska, you want to pick that one up? Sure. Um, so essentially the first, um, I don't want to say university, I'll say organization um, to create this type of environmental justice mapping tool would have been California um, with its Cal and Viro screens. So that wasn't necessarily a university, though I'm sure that there were academics and professors involved in making that. Um, and then there is also one in Washington, as we mentioned in the presentation, that was conducted from um, the University of Washington's Spatial Epidemiology Department, um, along with other um, organizations and stakeholders. Um, so it's not the first among universities to do it, um, but it is um, more unique within Pennsylvania compared to previous mapping tools for the state or commonwealth. Um, and Peter, if you can talk yeah. about where it comes from, because I sure, <laughs> sure. So, so at the beginning of the presentation, Nyla brought up um, their predecessor, Janelle Thompson, who is currently a justice fellow at the University of Cincinnati's law school, um, working actually with the city of Cincinnati on water law. So. She was the student advocate who had told, you know, university vice presidents, we, the Student Sustainability Advisory Council, the SSAC, believes the university needs to do more for environmental justice. And people thought, yeah, that's a great idea. Like, what do we do? So Doug Goodstein, and I at the Sustainability Institute said, let's hire someone and we'll figure out what it is we ought to do. And we ended up hiring Janelle. And so Janelle and I were working on things and what kept happening is as we would talk with people, we would start making maps, like we would just draw them, you know, like draw like a crummy little Pennsylvania, you know, and be like, well, you know, like, there's fracking infrastructure and we know there are nuclear power plants or coal, you know, like there's coal ash issues or, you know, all these different things. And 
but they were clumsy and we don't know GIS and our data is, you know, trying to pull from here and put it into a medium with that is a clumsy medium. And so Janelle and I at the end, near the end of her internship agreed that the next environmental justice intern or interns would have to know GIS and be really good with data. And that's where Nebraska and then Nyla came in because, you know, we have a someone who's really good with data and GIS and then someone who is really, really good with communication and, and policy. And they work together so well on history. The funding aspect right now it is entirely funded through the Sustainability Institute, but we're looking to to get it on five years of funding preferably in two graduate assistantships um, because, you know, certainly really, you know, facile students graduate. Well, I mean, they're both seniors, you know, they're able to do this. They're really exceptional. Um, but, you know, if being able to continue that, it could, it could grow it and then also be used by a clinician you know, to say, hmm, these people are suffering from these problems, say, going back to fracking, you know, um, Ewing sarcoma incidents are much higher in this area, and we can trace them to these census blocks or tracks, and look, we have proximity to some sort of chemical infrastructure, right? Yeah, that's great. I, I think the... Um generation of unique forms of, of data is is one of the great outcomes of this project. And again, I think that's something that would be pretty exciting to, to many people in the College of Science, including mm -hmm. me. <laughs> um, so uh, I noticed that uh, Nyla actually typed in an answer to a question. Um, and this is sort of addressing the intersection, I guess, between uh, individual rights and responsibilities, and then um, you know, governmental or bureaucratic entity rights and, and responsibilities. So Nyla, if you want to maybe just comment on that um, briefly, that would be great. Yeah, sure. So the EJ principles throughout them, they speak to the roles that individuals have, but oh, I realized I made a typo typing too fast. Um, EJ principle number 17 directly speaks to individual responsibility, noting that um, we make um, need to make personal and consumer choices to consume as little of Mother Earth as resources, um, produce little waste, and make conscious decisions to reprioritize our lifestyles to ensure the health of the natural world for present and future generations. I um, mean, indeed, we have a role in electing those um, legislators that we want to see reflect our our ones of how society should function. Um, but I think a reason why we focus so much on the responsibilities of those in government and those um, in corporations are because of their disproportionate impacts on regular people. If it wasn't for, we kind of follow those zoning laws or those policies and um, the things that are put in place and the um, enormous, um, I guess, um, say pollutants or um, outputs of these corporations. So those are kind of structuring um, uh, the society in which individuals live in. So while they do have choices to impact their immediate surroundings, we focus a lot on those um, bigger entities because of how much influence they have. Um, so if we maybe target those more, we'd be able to make a bigger impact on um, the world we are in. Yeah, and I, I, I think there's a, something else that's really important to address about that. And, you know, certainly every person has a responsibility to take care of themselves, to take care of their family, to do their best to be a good contributor to their neighborhood, whether that's by making sure that your park is clean, by not throwing garbage around, um, uh, or, you know, dumping, uh, you know, your antifreeze on your neighbor's lawn, right? One of the issues, though, is as we look at 
who has had or been granted or been able to realize their own individual rights or community rights or population rights in the United States is that um, we have a very, very clear history that some people, that all animals are created equal, but some animals are more equal than others to use George Orwell. And that, you know, the voting rights of um, people of color in the United States have for many, many, many years kept them from being able to exercise um, a, a level of political or economic power that I simply have because I'm the son of two, you know, highly educated people who live in the middle of Pennsylvania. And that that is not true for, you know, to, you know, the, a, a man, a black man my age in Philadelphia. So we can have the same level of responsibility, but the immediate sphere in which we live doesn't give us the agency or the economic opportunity in order to realize the same sort of outcomes and that the political structures that surround us in our legislatures big down to the level of your zoning hearing board and planning commission have given me opportunity and limited the opportunity of others and and i it, i mean i have lots of judgments about that that is a cold hard fact of american history great thank you both for addressing that question um I'm going to ask a question that's based a little bit on my own experience growing up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, um, which I noted was a high traffic area <laughs> on one of your maps. Um, so Peter, you earlier brought up the the idea of slums and and kind of areas of of cities and municipalities that might have more or less access to resources. I was struck when you were talking about that by thinking about my my own home city of Pencil of, of Lancaster and how in certain parts of the city, there are food deserts that have very um, strange rules about mixed zoning housing. Um, and there are also sort of industrial parks that have, have been abandoned over time and led to environmental degradation and that's affected um, neighborhoods, you know, in different ways. So it seems like to me that zoning is maybe one of the big drivers of, of geographically segregated environmental justice or injustice. And I'm wondering how you think, how the three of you think zoning policies might be re revised to encourage environmental justice. Um, so as you said, um, zoning is, is a big, issue when it comes to environmental injustice and racism. And so I'm not an urban planner, um, but it is kind of a geography issue. So I guess I'll, I can speak on it first is um, mixed zone housing uh, regulations and, and laws do have roots in redlining issues. Um, and so as Peter said, that political agency to go to your local zoning board and kind of um, advocate and push for what you want your community to, to be or to look like. Um, but obviously turning over decades of racist housing discrimination um, takes time. And um, yeah, it's definitely reflective of um, how we get environmental injustice and racism is definitely from housing uh, segregation and zoning laws. Um, and then food deserts often fall a part of that. Um, you can see food deserts in almost any major metropolitan area from Chicago to Baltimore to Philadelphia to New York, um, and they are often in Black and Latinx communities, um, one due to zoning, but also due to these corporations and grocery stores just not wanting to put their um, their products in Black and Latinx communities, like Whole Foods, for example. There are countless maps of Whole Foods not going into Black or Latinx communities, but they're going into white communities in Houston and Philly 
And so you get food deserts where um, people cannot buy fresh produce. And so that has health impacts um, that leads to health disparity rates due to racism. Um, so that was a very long-winded answer that covered a lot. So if Peter or Nyla want to um, add on to that, I'd love to. Thank you. Nyla, do you want, did you want to say anything? I kind of missed the question because my sister called me like four times in a row. So I was trying to decline the call, but I feel okay. like I got the gist of it. Yeah. No worries. I'll, I'll just say uh, some things that, that can, dealing with the, the decades and decades long, generationally long problems of segregation, impoverishment, lack of access to high quality education, lack of access to safe, reliable transportation, food, you know, you know, you line all those things up and you can look at all of them on the sustainable development goals and say, oh, there's a missed target, there's a missed target, there's a, miss. you know, you're talking about dozens of targets spread out across several goals and they are generational. So they have been happening for a long time. So deliberate disinvestment and disempowerment have been a part of the game. Overcoming that is very, very difficult and will take focus, people, and money. And therefore, with that money, a lot of materials, right? To rebuild. And we can't, you know, zoning, we can do some zoning changes to encourage, you know, redevelopment authorities to invest, right? We could set up, you know, um, even like a, um, a sustainable development bank, right? To overcome these sorts of things in order to invest, you know, in, in, in these in neighborhoods and things like that, and then empower people there and trust them with their own governance. So that can, but that's long time. It's a lot of money. That also means that with big influxes of money, there's also a lot of chance for corruption, which is part of what keeps people from doing it. And there's distrust because those people over there and we're these people over here. And, you know, so it, it's a, that's a huge issue. Alongside that, I think that we need to have, and this is, has been made really clear by COVID, problems of affordable housing. We need better affor general affordable housing policy to create that sort of mixed income neighborhood and include, I, I would advocate for, and this is not Peter Buck, the Sustainability Institute guy saying this, this is Peter Buck through my you know, probably just my own personal opinion, uh, saying that there needs to, there ought to be very strong affirmative action um, policies built into those loans, et cetera, et cetera, to overcome that level of marginalization that's happened. We won't do it unless we, we make it an absolute priority. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll finish up with one question that is maybe a little bit forward looking and, and hopefully a little uh, you know, optimistic and, and with a potential positive outcome. So actually, Peter, you and I, right before this, were talking about the you know, sort of climate conservation core, civilian conservation core ideas that are being um, put forth in our, at the national level. And I'm curious whether the three of you think that uh, instituting things like tree planting programs in specific neighborhoods that might provide employment and environmental improvement, um, as well as creating outdoor recreation areas that are also potentially related to sustainability. I'm reminded of the, the Muddy Run pumped hydro facility that I spent a lot of time uh, at when I was growing up in, in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Um, you know, being a, a great outdoor place that was also a, a way of storing energy, storing renewable energy and making it available. Um, 
So I'm curious whether you have plans to use these maps to sort of think aspirationally about potential opportunities for doing these types of activities that are going to help improve environments, improve equity, and you know, also just, just make Pennsylvania a more beautiful place to live. I think absolutely. I think that's the overarching goal is for this to be used to influence policy and um, make real changes in people's lives. And I think those um, two examples you brought up are great ideas and making sure that those are done equitably and ethically. We see um, issues in Philadelphia right now where there's um, resources being directed towards uh, marginalized communities and then people who are not of those backgrounds are like overusing them and they aren't um, taking um, good care of. So I do think um, those are great ideas and I think that is the ultimate um, aspirational, but like why we decided to do this project in, in the first place, how can it um, really help people and I think it being on a website and being cool and interactive is great but um, I think like I said earlier what it's being used for is the most um, important thing and I think um, also how it can connect um, issues of climate and sustainability to EJ issues is also um, an important connection that hopefully it can facilitate. You want to say something, Nebraska? Oh, no, I just agree with Nyla. <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to add one quick thing. So the second or third slide in the presentation had a quote from a story on the Allegheny front. One third of people in Pennsylvania are in this DEP environmental justice zones, right? They just did a story last week or the week before on environmental justice that has absolutely to do with what Charlie just said, which is about the presence of trees in communities. And then what we see is that you have lower urban heat island effect, lower levels of asthma, lower levels of heat stroke. I think Nyla brought up heat stroke earlier, right? There is stormwater mitigation associated with it. Um, people in the presence of trees are more relaxed. So when you think about those things, all the things that there's this bumper sticker you can get if you want it says trees are the answer. Trees are often the answer. When we think about kids, the most vulnerable people besides the very elderly, kids, kids in the presence of trees are less stressed out. Lower levels of stress hormones in an individual person set them up to be in a better place as they grow up, they develop more easily, right? The other things in their lives are easier for them to do. The simple fact or the simple action of doing more with trees so that we can be healthier and more relaxed, it's not gonna solve all our problems, but it will do a good, it'll do good for us. And I think that um, I would love to use this map to spur, you know, tree planting all over Pennsylvania, which is already almost 60% forested, but how can we have wonderful urban forests, you know? Yeah, I think that would be, that would be awesome. Right, and those trees would also help us uh, remove some of the carbon emissions that we're doing in Pennsylvania. Um, so I'm just gonna highlight one more point uh, from an audience member who brings up um, some recent programming on WPSU um, that highlights the African American experience in various spheres. Um, and, you know, the potential to watch those kinds of programs while highlighting and, and thinking about environmental injustice and the Black experience might be helpful for getting people of, of other groups, such as white middle class people, to, to get more interested in environmental justice. So I would encourage people to reach out for those resources. And thank you for that comment. Um, I think I'm going to wrap things up there just based on time. And uh, so that will conclude our 30 minute question and answer period. When you exit today's lecture, you'll be given the option of providing feedback about today's presentation and your feedback helps us ensure that these lectures are meeting our objectives and your inform informational needs. 
I want to thank everyone for attending the sixth and final presentation of the Ashtakar Frontiers of Science lectures in the Everly College of Science. We appreciate your attendance at this lecture series and want to extend a special thank you to all of our speakers, including today's speakers, for generously sharing their time and expertise with us. We would also like to extend our thanks to Dr. Ashtakar for his generous support of this lecture series now and throughout its 27 years of presenting Penn State science to the central Pennsylvania community. So Peter, Nebraska, and Nyla, thank you so much again for your time today, and I wish everyone a good week.